you know, it's funny listening to your stories there about uh, open planned classrooms. Um, you know, in England, um, for many years, I have to say it's stopped now, but for many years uh, we were building schools with classrooms without walls. And, and my father, who grew up in Guyana in South America, in, in the depths of poverty, you know, where he didn't have shoes and uh, lots and lots of brothers and sisters, and, 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 and he, um, I told him about these, these classrooms, and he said, well, yeah, I, I, I remember having a similar situation. We used to have to put sheets up to divide up the classes, except the big difference is that we were spending 35 million pounds on these buildings, or 70 million uh, New Zealand dollars on these buildings, whereas for my poor father and his, his, his classmates, it was because they couldn't afford the walls that they didn't have them. And, uh, and he was just baffled by the idea that so much money could be spent on something that they that, that they were, were working so hard to, 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 to try and fix in, in their very poverty-stricken country. So um, I, I'm here to tell you about Michaela. Uh, and uh, Roger's already done a great job, actually, <laughs> of, of telling you lots about it. Uh, the big thing at Michaela, I think, are our values. And uh, at Michaela, what we always say to the children is we do what is right, even when it's difficult, especially when it's difficult. Um, and the last eight years have been difficult. <laughs> um, and that's when you have to dig deep. And I want you all to think about that here, because you have a difficult journey ahead of you. You've got to dig deep and find resolve you never knew you had. You know, I want to think, thank the, the New Zealand Initiative, you know, Roger and Oliver and Chelsea, and, uh, you know, for inviting me here to Auckland to speak to you. You know, I was just saying this afternoon that Auckland could easily win the prize for the most beautiful city in the world with your volcanoes and your islands and the water and the bridges and the boulevards. And, and, and of course, I was born here, so, you know, <laughs> in, in many ways, I feel I've come home. And I particularly want to thank Briar Lipson for doing such a fantastic job of organizing my visit here. You know, when I spoke to her a couple of months ago, asking about the plans for my visit, uh, she said, well, you know, Catherine, I'm pregnant, and uh, next Friday is my last day at work, but everything's organized. Uh, um, I, I have my husband and my mother-in-law, uh, and they're booked on flights, and, and if baby comes on time, we'll be there with baby watching, uh, you do your thing. And, and, and I have to say, baby is there, and mother-in-law and husband are here, and uh, I just saw husband giving baby a bottle out, out, out there, and uh, I was inspired by her determination. And um, she said that when months before, when she told everyone here that she was pregnant, there had been some initial discussions about altering plans. And Briar told everyone that she knew what I would say if I'd been facing the same situation, and that I would have said that the show must go on, and that nothing should stop us from doing what has to be done. And she's right. Even when it's difficult, especially when it's difficult, you just keep going. And so, as I said, I was born here in Auckland. My mother and father lived in Parnell in, in 1973, where I, when I was born. And uh, my father had a fellowship at the University of Auckland. And I can only imagine how hard it must have been for my mother, so far away from her own mother and father and other family, having her first child. But she dug deep, and she kept on going. My mother used to take me to the Rose Garden in Parnell, so I went there earlier this week to see it, and also the National Women's Hospital where I was born. And as was mentioned earlier by Oliver, I was named after Catherine Mansfield, and my middle name is Moana. So my parents thought to give me a Maori name because they, they felt a certain affinity with the Maori people as they knew what it was like to be an ethnic minority. So my name is all about New Zealand. I left Auckland at the age of six months and then spent the next 15... I know, I know. Um, I spent the next 15 years of my life growing up in Toronto, in Canada. And uh, before New Zealand, like many West Indians, my, so my father, as I said, is Guyanese, my mother is Jamaican, they spent some years in the mother country, in Britain, and then um, they moved to, to Canada. They returned to England when I was 15 years old, and I have been there ever since. So Michaela opened in, in 2014, as we were saying earlier, uh, 120 year sevens. We now have 480 pupils, year seven to 10. Every year we take in another 120. 
And that means next year we'll have our first GCSE O-level results in August 2019 and our first entrance to university in 2021. We're in inner city, I wanted to show you that video because we're in inner city school in terms of intake and I wanted you to get a sense of that by watching that. You know, some very challenging children uh, from a, a variety of multicultural backgrounds. Um, you know, we're like one of those inner city schools that you might see in Holly Hollywood films, surrounded by gangs. I mean, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not exaggerating, where young men show up outside school on, on bicycles, masked, looking for some of our boys, carrying knives. This is a normal occurrence. But within our school walls, with our children, you would have no idea that they come from such challenging backgrounds. And that is, I believe, because we offer our children a quality of education that does not expect less of them because they are from the inner city. We don't make them learn things that are relevant to their lives. We don't have them learning things that are more engaging through play and fun. We succeed with our children because we don't treat them differently with a misguided view that brown, black, working class children cannot access and do not deserve to access the same curriculum content that their whiter or richer counterparts do at another school. In the UK, we spend 90 billion pounds on our education system. At the start of our book, we've got a book called The Michaela Way. Uh, it's the battle hymn of tiger teachers is what we call it. There's a Yes, um, there's a quote by Victor Hugo. Nothing is more powerful than an idea whose time has come. And it is my belief that while more money is always nice, and it's always very nice, what is even more important in changing education is changing the ideas within the education system. If we change the ideas, we'll get the success we want. So Michaela's a free school, like your partnership schools here in New Zealand. It took us three years to set up Michaela because we had a number of detractors protesting with placards outside. I mean, imagine, you know, you're opening up a school. I kept saying, you know, it's like we're building a nuclear bomb or something. I mean, we're just setting up a school, but there they were with their placards. Um, they would scupper our plans for buildings. They did all sorts of things to, to stop us from opening. They would hand out flyers to parents saying that the only reason we'd been given the go-ahead for the school was because I was best friends with the Prime Minister, David Cameron. And to tell you the truth, I think that that lie, and it was a lie, it, it, more, it, it helped us really rather than hindering us because the families were really impressed with the fact that I apparently knew the Prime Minister. So why did they hate us so much? Well, free schools were very unpopular with the teaching profession. So not unlike how partnership schools are viewed here. I naively gave this speech in 2010 at the Conservative Party conference and it got me to a lot of hot water. I condemned the state of education in Britain as I saw it then and eventually I ended up without a job and, and was told by many people that I would never work in state education ever again because what I'd done was unthinkable. So times were hard. The thing I loved most in the world was my job. I've never understood the expression, those who can't teach. Teaching was always the most thrilling thing, shaping children's minds, helping them to create their futures. I thought about the private sector for a bit. I did, and, and while I have nothing against the private sector, and I'm glad there are private schools, and I've visited a number of them and learned a lot from them, I wasn't sure it was for me. I love working with kids from either disadvantaged or challenging backgrounds, and it's also what I'm good at. So I didn't know what to do. I just wanted to be a teacher. And I'm not a fan of bureaucracy and red tape, but in the end, I realized that the only way that I'd be able to work with the kids I love was if I set up my own school. So I went to it. Nowadays, people who are interested in setting up a free school, they ask me for advice often, you know, and they wonder how I kept going for so long. And looking back now, it makes a nice story. You know, we, we struggled for three years, but eventually we opened our school, and now look how wonderful it is. But at the time, we had no idea that we were going to succeed. There have been many other free schools that have tried to set up and failed. I have known some of these people personally, and sadly, they just never got there. But I couldn't give up, even when it's difficult, especially when it's difficult. We tried to set up in three different parts of London. And in each of those three places, we put everything we had into it. 
marching up and down rainy streets, handing out flyers, visiting community centers, churches, mosques, gathering parents together for parents' evenings, hiring bouncers to deal with the threats that were coming from the protesters. They would stand outside our evenings with their placards. Uh, I'd have to stand up in front of an audience that I knew had been infiltrated by detractors who at any moment would stand up to disrupt and start shouting abuse. One woman once jumped up and pointed her finger at me and said, you betrayed us, she shouted. And all I was thinking was, I don't even know who you are. So those three years setting up were tough. Uh, and even once we'd opened, detractors would, would protest outside, right? Uh, and the children would have to go, you know, arrive in the morning, leave in the evenings, and the protesters were there. They even broke into our school at night. They would hand out flyers to our year sevens, saying that the building was a health and safety hazard and that we were endangering them. And you can imagine the fallout with parents over that. But we just kept on going. There's something about helping to paint your own school that makes it yours. I was pushing the bins out and answering the phones with, Michaela Community School, how can I help? For the longest time, I had an A3 photocopy on my door saying headmistress, until I finally said, OK, we need to take these signs down. They make us look like teenagers playing at running a school. We're still not there, of course. And not until we have results will I feel we are completely secure. It has to be said that, you know, as Roger was saying, you know, the inspectorate body Ofsted giving us our outstanding and the highest possible grade, that does go a long way to protecting our future, but we still don't have results. That's the thing about a free school, or at least our free school. You keep on going without the security of knowing that tomorrow will definitely come. The threats and attacks have stopped for now. Thank goodness. But you never know, with our profile, when you might have to dive for cover. Nowadays, it's not our free school status that upsets people. And many have long forgotten that speech of mine in 2010. It's what Michaela stands for that some don't like. We are what one would call traditional. We stand in the face of progressivism, which is very seductive. Ken Robinson's video on YouTube does a great job of explaining progressive thinking in education, and it has over 5 million views. When we're setting up our school, when we were setting it up, my own governors, all sensible people, all committed to the cause of trying to transform the lives of children in the inner city. They were helping me out on the streets, giving out those flyers and so on, going into hairdressers. And one of them came up to me and she said, but I, I, I've seen this video by Ken Robinson and I, I, I don't understand. So I sent it to all my governors. And they all looked at me like cocker spaniels. How can this be, Catherine? What Ken Robinson says, it just seems so right. Except that it's all completely wrong, right? It's just all wrong. The progressives say that learning is boring, so we have to make it relevant to kids by making it fun and entertaining. But that necessarily means dumbing things down. The simple fact is that subjects themselves are intrinsically interesting. Do we think that when chemists go to the lab to work, they feel miserable because they know that they'll be bored by chemistry that they do all day? No, of course not. They love chemistry. And why do they love it? Because they know lots about it. Knowledge of something makes that something interesting. I have to say that I worry about the content of the New Zealand school curriculum. You talk about learning areas instead of subjects and key competencies instead of content. And I see the same themes that plagued the old curriculum in England. Michael Gove, Education Secretary from 2010 to 2014, changed that for us. This is why it's so important for those of you with political power to thoroughly understand the education debate and give everything you've got to changing it for the better. Because if you don't, all of your children will suffer. And in particular, the poorest will suffer because they don't have the backgrounds filled with tutors and parental support. They don't have dinner table talk every evening, which involves the politics of the day, skimming over geography, history, science, without those in conversation even realizing that that's what they're doing. Education is the future of any civilization.
And those of you who can help your schools secure your country's future have a duty to do what is right, even when it's difficult, especially when it's difficult. Before 2010 in England, the debate around knowledge versus skills didn't exist. Skills teaching was all that existed, except in the closed classrooms of rare teachers like Michaela, the woman, who we named the school after and who died of cancer in 2011. Nowadays, thanks to the revolution started by Gove, just one man, there are a small number of teachers fighting for change in the UK. Without the political explosion that happened when Gove was in position, Michaela would not exist. Without the new school's network, our free school and all the others would not exist. Your equivalent, now let me see if I say this correctly, etapuria, something, you know, there we go, <laughs> um, needs political backing and financial support if your partnership schools are to succeed and if you are to have any more of them. Edie Hirsch's ideas are what have inspired many schools in the US to make knowledge central to their curriculum. For those of you with a real interest in what makes a good education, read his most recent book. I think it, it encapsulates all of his other books really well. It's called Why Knowledge Matters. And an American cognitive scientist worth reading is Daniel Willingham, Why Students Don't Like School. They do a great job of explaining in detail why engagement, why engagement relevance, all this stuff, should not be goals of the classroom. When learning knowledge is not the goal, and when memory has been abandoned as a concept because of a romantic belief that pupils should simply discover thinking for themselves, children who cannot access that knowledge at home will suffer the most. In the schools where I worked over my long career, often pupils didn't know who Churchill was. You know, Winston Churchill? There was this insurance advertisement on the television at the time with this dog called Churchill, and so the pupils who weren't in the top set used to think that Churchill was a dog. <laughs> and who were these pupils? The poorer ones, the ones who couldn't afford books at home. The saddest thing about the progressive movement is that it hurts the very people it wants to help. So why are these people uncomfortable about teaching a body of knowledge? Often people are uncomfortable about the knowledge itself. What should that body of knowledge be? Who are we to say that Shakespeare is better than Benjamin Zephaniah? So he's a, a modern black British author. Might it not be true that black children won't be able to connect with Shakespeare in the same way that a white child can? Wouldn't doing a French rap song be more fr fun for, for black kids than, than learning lists of French verbs? But black kids and white kids are all the same. They're just kids. To think otherwise is to be, well, racist. And yes, making up rap songs is fun. Of course it is. For all kids, whatever their color, whatever their class. That's why kids do that in their spare time. It's fun. It's our job at school, however, to expose children to thoughts, knowledge, ideas that they might otherwise have never come across. If you believe that a subject is intrinsically interesting and that it is the teacher's role to inspire children, whatever their color, to see just how interesting it is, then it means you don't have to entertain them by performing. You don't have to learn French by making up French song, rap songs. I mean, you only learn a little bit of French, you do it that way. You learn it properly by breaking it down to its smallest components, learning how to pronounce the sounds, the grammar to write and properly and so on. If you inspire children by actually teaching them and by being a teacher instead of what the progressives call a facilitator of learning, you don't have to group desks together so that they can do so-called fun activities. The reality of these activities is that when kids are left to chat, they chat about who kissed who behind the bike shed and they never learn a thing. I mean, think about yourselves when you were at school if you were ever allowed to do that kind of thing. What did you talk about? But teach them properly from the front of the class and they learn. And most importantly, they develop a love of learning. Sadly, the pursuit of creativity has made some of us forget the importance of knowledge. It makes us forget that textbooks give good knowledge. We forget that without textbooks, consistency of knowledge disappears. One cannot be inquisitive about something one knows little about. 
One cannot think independently about something if you have little basic knowledge of it. But it gets worse. Not only do we deny our children real knowledge, but we turn to digital technology thinking that it will make things better. Classrooms are filled with iPads and laptops instead of real learning. People think there is little need to teach pupils much of anything anymore because, well, after all, you can just look it up on Google. But such statements are made by adults who take their own cultural knowledge for granted. One cannot use Google successfully without knowing lots so that you can quickly sift through the relevant and irrelevant information to find what you want. iPads may be fun, and you know, some learning can take place with them, but so often they are used because they are entertaining and they tick the technology box instead of really useful learning happening in the classroom. Teachers at Michaela, they stand at the front of the class and they teach. Every day at Michaela, we get five to eight teachers visiting, often deputy heads and heads themselves, wanting to take something from our school. So I know that people know, they, they, they believe that what we're doing is interesting. Just as we have benefited from visiting other schools and nicking ideas from them, others nick ideas from us. Visitors often find our behavior system of no excuses interesting. You know, I was on the radio several times today, and every time they were saying, oh, you're, you're Britain's strictest teacher, is what they would always introduce me as. And people love this idea of strictest school and strictest teacher. We believe that our no excuses system means the most vulnerable children at the school, those who have either unsupportive or ineffectual parents, poor parents, that we are effectively supporting them through the school. The result is happy, confident, kind young people. All of our visiting teachers comment on how resilient and kind our pupils are. They always want to know the secret. But we believe the secret is simple. Expect a lot of children and they will rise to the standards you demand. We insist that pupils take personal responsibility. We also teach the pupils kindness and gratitude. You saw a bit of that in the video. Our motto is work hard, be kind. We want our pupils to do both. At lunch, we have them stand to give appreciations publicly, as you saw. We do this um, both to give them the chance to speak publicly and practice speaking to a large group, so they'll practice to 200 other children and they can stand up and speak. But we also want to get them used to feeling gratitude. Some say that gratitude shouldn't be taught. But with a four-year-old, you, you insist that they need to say thank you before giving them the chocolate. Well, we don't believe it's any different with a 12-year-old. So I have a personal dog in this fight. I started at New College Oxford, at Oxford University, in 1991, so a very long time ago, and um, I didn't really belong there. I didn't have the kind of education that my counterparts had, so I struggled to fit in. And last year, New College, um, my college, invited me back to give a talk at one of their outreach conferences for teachers. The conference was to encourage and inform teachers of the Oxford admissions process so as to widen access and encourage more pupils with a state school background to apply. And I explained to the audience how strange it was for me to be speaking there because, you know, I was so out of place at Oxford and I, I never found a way to fit in. And, 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 and when I finally finished there, after my finals, the exams, I packed up all of my things and rode my bike to the train station bought a one-way ticket to London and didn't go back for 10 years. I might never have gone back had I not been inspired by the pupils I worked with and colleagues and all of us doing what we could do to widen uh, access to Oxbridge. And so I took pupils to Oxford to inspire them and to encourage them to apply. And you'll be pleased to know that 10 years after my departure, when I looked outside the train station, my bike was no longer there. So the ghosts were gone. It was finally time for me to help children, not that different from me, to get into one of the most extraordinary universities in the world. And so I did, and pupils got in. But our sites at Michaela are grander than that. We don't just want them to get in. We want to teach our children so well, so that when they get there, they might not feel as awkward as their headmistress once did. I want them to come to the end of their degrees and not to feel compelled to tie their bicycle up outside the train station and never return. 
I don't want them to do that, if only to save poor Oxford City Council the trouble of having to forcibly remove all of these bikes abandoned at that tragic train station. There is so much potential here in New Zealand. Ten years ago in England, we were in the same position that you are in now. Anything is possible with vision and courage. You just need to dig deep. Each of you has a role to play in the fight. Each of you needs to do your bit. I'm amazed that there are nearly 300 people here this evening. I really, I, I'm, I'm just stunned, you know. I, 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 there are many countries this wouldn't happen, where so many of you from, from a variety of different backgrounds, you know, you're not just from educational backgrounds, and yet you're here together, interested in what I'm saying, you know. And um, over the last few years, through meeting some of you, like Fraser over there, who, who has read our Michaela book and, and whose wife has, has read our book, and then he read it a second time, and I, I bet you his children will be reading our book next. And, uh, you know, it's extraordinary. And um, it's become clear to me, uh, in meeting some of you, how, how much you care about your country. You are New Zealanders. And, and you believe in making New Zealand the best that it can be. And here you are, investing your time and money to pursue the ideal of a better New Zealand. And it can be better. Right now, I slightly worry that you're about to go off a cliff as a country. And that's because the future of any country is its education system. And you have decided to pursue competencies in your curriculum, project-based learning in your classrooms, whole word reading methods in your primary schools. You're abandoning testing and traditional teaching methods that have worked around the world for hundreds of years. But there is a way to stop the madness. It just requires each and every one of you in this room to make some noise, to demand more from your government, to keep on shouting until someone takes notice. The key thing I've learned in setting up Michaela is to always keep going, whatever the distractions, even when it's difficult, especially when it's difficult. Even when the world is coming down around you, even when you think you can't possibly win, just keep going. As Peter Pan said, the moment you doubt whether you can do it, you cease forever to be able to fly. Keep on believing and you'll get there. And when you do, I'll be smiling from the other side of the world. Thank you.